he knows what is right he wants to go with what is right he knows that is what is true identity is true identity is holiness true identity is to live clean true identity is to be free from sin he knows that his true identity is to rule and dominate over every problem he knows his true identity is never to lack anything but live in the absolute provision and the grace of god you So Sam Chaladurai invites you to the special Christmas and New Year services of AFT Chennai. The service will be held at the Jesus Calls campus in Vanagaram, Chennai. Our Christmas service is on December 25th at 6 a.m. and our New Year service is on December 31st at 10 p.m. Messages will be in English with translation in Tamil. Everyone is welcome. We hope to see you there. Have you ever heard of people talking about soul sleep? They talk about soul sleep. What they mean is when you die, your body is buried in the earth. What happens to your soul? Your soul enters into a kind of sleep, they say. Where do they get that idea of sleep? Because the Bible talks about people who are dead as people who are sleeping. Have you ever read that? In Daniel chapter 12, it talks about the dead as those who sleep. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13, it talks about, uh, I don't want you to... grieve about those who are sleeping he says paul is referring to those who are dead it's a euphemism for uh, death it's not saying the dead people are sleeping it's saying the people are dead and it's another way to say it that's all instead of saying don't be don't be so grieving about uh, don't be grieving like the world uh, about the people who have passed away and are dead says don't be grieving about the ones that are asleep that expression is about uh it's about death it's not saying that dead people are asleep it's just saying that that people are dead you know it's another way of saying that people are dead but they have taken that and they have gone you know really to the extreme some people have taken that and said 
Well, the dead people are sleeping. Read the Bible. It says they are asleep. Those that are asleep. Those that are asleep. No, it says those that are dead. That's the way you should read it. You know, it's just using language in that way. It's very clear. It's talking about those that are dead. Now, so people are not in a sleepy state or in a coma state, in a state where they don't know anything. They're just floating around. Their souls are simply in an unconscious state. The Bible clearly says that the person who's dead, his body is buried, but the person stays alive. The person is conscious, as conscious as ever before, and even more conscious uh, than ever before. Uh, even though he does not have a body, he is a person, and he stays conscious. Look at the scripture what it, uh, and the way it talks about it. In Ecclesiastes 12, 7, I don't want to read everything, but you can note it down. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says that when we die, our body returns to the dust where it came from. Our spirit returns to God from whom it came, right? So there is a split that happens there. When a person dies, the body is returned to the dust. Why? Because it was taken from the dust. And the spirit returns to God because God gave the spirit, right? And the spirit returns to God, it says. And that spirit, that person, is a spirit, you see. He returns to God. He's not dead. He's not dead. He's not sleeping. Only the body is in that condition. Only the body is not awake. Only the body is dead. He is out there with God. Another scripture, Luke chapter 16, verse 22 to 31. It's another passage, a wonderful passage, where it's talking about the... It's talking about the poor man Lazarus and the rich man. And in that story, both of them one day die and both go into eternity. One goes to heaven, the other goes to hell. But both of them maintain consciousness. They are in a conscious state. Particularly, talk, Jesus tells the story and and he reveals what he thinks about how people are after death. He's talking about dead people, and he says the rich man went into a place of agony, where there was so much agony that he was agonizing, he was thirsty, and he cries out from there. And he sees, Ab he sees this rich, uh, Lazarus sitting at the bosom of Abraham. And he says, please allow Lazarus to dip his finger in water and let him come and touch my tongue. I'm in such agony here, he says. So he knows where he is. He knows where the Lazarus, poor Lazarus is. He knows that he's in a bad place, a place of agony. He knows, he knows Lazarus is in a good place, a place of comfort, Abraham's bosom in heaven. He realizes these things. He knows who Lazarus is. He knows who he is. He knows who Father Abraham is. Everything he knows. <laughs> totally conscious state. He's able to actually actually understand far more than what he would normally understand when he was in the, in the body on this earth. And then he says something remarkable. He says, I have brothers. He remembers his home, his brothers. He says, I have brothers there. Please send somebody to tell them that they shouldn't live like me and end up here in hell. Tell them to straighten out. Somebody must take the good news to them so that they don't come here also to this place of pain and agony. And uh, he wants Lazarus to go. And he says, if somebody goes from the dead and tells them, they'll believe. See the kind of discussion that goes on. <laughs> is a dead man capable of speaking all that? A man who's dead and in hell, is he capable of speaking so much? He's so knowledgeable about himself, his condition, knowledgeable about this poor man who begged at his door, every day and his condition, he's, so, he's thinking in hell about salvation, that he has missed it, missed it and he cannot have it, but he wants his brothers to have it and he's concerned about them. He wants somebody to go and tell them. Amazing. Yeah. So I would say conscious state is maintained. Even after death, conscious men and women are in a conscious state, fully conscious, even more conscious, more conscious than ever before. Philippians 1.23 is another passage where Paul says, 
to die is gain because I'm going to be with Christ. So he's not, uh, he's not talking as if to die means to be in a coma state, you know, where I don't know anything happening, you know, I can forget about No, no, he says to die is gain. See, if you're going to enter into a state of coma, when you die, you won't say it's gain because it's neither gain nor loss, you know. He says it's gain because it's far better than this state that I'm in, he says. Far better than living in this earth. It's far better for me to go there and live there. And I want to do that, he says. But for your sake, I'll remain here, he says. Second Corinthians 5.8 is another passage where he says, to, the abs to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Absent here, present there. That's what happens at death. So he's a real person moving from one place to another. That's the way the Bible talks about it. And one very significant passage is Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9, where it's talking about those people that gave their life as martyrs, suffered and died for Christ, for the sake of Christ and for the word of God. And look at what they are doing. It's talking about their spirits in heaven. They're dead. Their bodies are buried on earth. And their spirits are there before the throne of God. And listen to this. 6-9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw, the al uh, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So they suffered and died for the sake of Christ and for the word of God and for their testimony of this salvation through Jesus Christ and so on. Verse 10 says, and they cried with a loud voice. Look at what they're doing. They're in God's presence now. These spirits of these men, what, is, what are they doing? They cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Being in the presence of God, not having their body with them, their spirits in the presence of God, crying out in the presence of God, saying, How, are you, how long are you going to wait, O Lord, holy Lord? When are you going to bring justice to those who did this thing to us? When can we see it? They're waiting to see God avenging his enemies. So, very alive, I would say. As alive as you would be here and even more, I would say. So there is no such thing as soul sleep, you know. No such thing as soul sleep. Now, also there are many other ref references I don't have time to go into. If you read the book of Revelation, it talks about the spirits of people that are dead, that are in heaven, and the saints that are there in heaven from the Old Testament and so on, and how in heaven there is worship going on, active worship going on, how they're praising God, and they're talking and worshiping in heaven, um, and uh, it's, it, the way it describes it, it looks like amazing, amazing worship, worship session is going on there. Real people, really alive, alive to God, very conscious of their joy, their peace, their rejoicing in God's presence. They're even crying out to God to bring justice on this earth. Many of them died as martyrs, very alive, very much alive. All right. And it's important, you know, to understand the whole point of redemption and the total scheme of redemption, then only you'll understand what the Bible says about heaven. Only when you understand what the Bible says about heaven, you'll understand the love of God. Now, if you think you're going to enter into eternity and you're going to be in a coma state where you don't know anything, then no use talking about the joy of heaven and, and what you're going to do there, what life is going to be like there, what does it matter? You're not going to know anything. I want to talk more about it. Because the Bible has much to say about it. Therefore, I'm laying the foundation now to tell you that those that are in heaven are not sleeping. They are not in an unconscious state. They are in a conscious state, fully able to enjoy it, able to know, fully able to rejoice, fully able to react, fully able to converse, talk, and so on. Now, see, in everybody, there is a longing inside of them, all of us that live on this earth, have you noticed there is a longing, there is a pull inside of us towards the Garden of Eden and that kind of life. It seems like somehow man is homesick. He knows 
that his granddaddy came from a wonderful place called Eden. A most beautiful place where everything was so good. Everything was there in plenty. There was no lack, no want, no poverty, no sickness, no nothing. You know, nothing evil was there. Everything was good. It's a wonderful place that God had prepared and God has placed them there and God came and walked with them and talked with them at the cool, in the cool of the day every day. They conversed with God. They had fellowship with God. They lived in peace, even with animals. They were not fighting one another, hurting one another, harming one another. Lived in absolute peace, with absolute provision of God, living and thriving in the blessings of God. It seems like to me that man in his heart somehow knows that he must return to that kind of a life and not stay in this kind of... He knows that he's not made for this kind of mess. Have you ever noticed that? In your heart, you do not like the mess that you face in this world. You don't like the restlessness, the peacelessness, the trouble that you face. You don't like the poverty. You don't like, you know. The devil has lied to people so much that now some people even started liking poverty. So much that they're taking even vows of poverty that I will be poor. I mean, the world has gone topsy-turvy to the extreme, you know. The Christian world I'm talking about. <laughs> Amazing how we have adapted to all the devil's lies. You know, the devil has told us, this is the life that God has for you, you know. You become poor and stay poor. You take a vow and you be poor and so then you'll be so special, you know. And we've believed and taken the bait and, and gone with it. But if you look at man in his heart, he knows. He knows that he needs, that he knows that he needs to live in, the abs live in the absolute provision of God, not lacking anything. He knows that he needs to live a clean life, moral life, not having all the moral problems and, the, and on all the uh, drawing towards sin and all that. He, he knows that the sin nature is alien to him. It doesn't belong to him. It is disturbing him. It's pro giving a problem to him all the time. It is contrary to his original nature that God had put within him. It is something that is alien, that has gotten into him and troubling him and is destroying him, tearing him up every day. Man knows. He wants to be free from it. That's why Paul talks about the man who is in sin, crying out to God, saying, Oh, what a wretched man I am. Who can deliver me from this body of death? Romans chapter 7. That's the cry of every man. He doesn't want to live like that. He doesn't want to do wrong things. He wants to live clean. He wants to live, live good. He knows that he's a moral being. He needs to live holy. He knows that. Now, a person may not go to church, may not read the Bible, may not believe in God, but he believes in good and bad. How is that? He'll tell you the man next door is a very bad man. So how do you know he's a bad man? Because, you know, he murdered a person last month. So who told you murder is wrong? <laughs> you don't read the Bible. You don't go to church. You don't believe in God. You're not a religious person, but you still believe that murder is wrong. You say, the man across the street is a thief. He's a bad guy. I don't like him. He's corrupt. Well, who told you corruption is wrong? Who told you robbing and being a thief is wrong? See, man is innately a moral being. He has a moral anchor inside of him. He knows what is right. He wants to go with what is right. He knows that is what his true identity is. True identity is holiness. True identity is to live clean. True identity is to be free from sin. He knows that his true identity is to rule and dominate over every problem. He knows his true identity is never to lack anything but live in the absolute provision and the grace of God. He knows that. That's the way he's supposed to live. And that's why he's always aspiring to go back to the Garden of Eden. You give him a house, let him buy a house, he tries to make it like a Garden of Eden. He buys the nicest sofas, nicest dining table, makes a modular kitchen, throws out that old, ugly-looking fridge and buys, buys a nice fridge, you know. He buys nice, soft beds, throws out the other stuff, you know. He wants some nice stuff. If he is doing things that are wrong, 
he feels so guilty, he feels so bad. If you really ask him, he says, I, I don't want to do this really. I want to be free from it. I just don't want to live like this, you know. I hate this. I hate that I'm doing this. I hate that I'm getting angry. I hate that I'm blowing up. I hate that I'm speaking badly. I hate that I'm using bad words. I hate that I'm doing things that are not acceptable. He will tell you, you know. He will tell you. The worst man will tell you, I hate what I'm doing. I don't like to do it. But there is some power in me, this alien power called sin that has come and is occupying my heart, shaking me up and really destroying me day by day with sin and its activities. So there is a pull towards the Garden of Eden. Man knows that this is not the life that God had for him. That is the life that God had for him. He must get back to it. And what's going to happen in the end is man cannot make it there by himself. But God is going to, through his salvation and through his redemption, when it's totally complete, when the bodily redemption is complete, when the redemption of the earth is complete, God is literally going to take him back to Eden and put him back there and restore him totally and completely. Are you there? That's your destiny. That's where we are headed. What, so heaven to me is the fulfillment of all that I desire, all that I long for. I know in my heart that's where I belong. I know that's what my life is to be like. My life has to be like heaven. That's why I try to make my family like heaven, my life like heaven, my heart like heaven. That's why I try to cleanse myself of all the wrong things that make it hell. Get rid of all those things and make it as good as possible right here on this earth because I'm aspiring for that perfect heaven which is not possible now. By the grace of God, we can now live victoriously over sin. It's important to live that and be personally happy and have heaven in our heart and have peace and joy in a world that takes away your peace. You have a peace that the world cannot take away. It is important to live like that. Experience the foretaste of heaven right here. But you're always longing for that. And, uh, and your longing is going to be fulfilled when God completes the work of redemption, finishes his work of redemption, and takes you to heaven. Right? Now, there's a lot of, once again, there's a lot of wrong opinions about uh, heaven. Where did it come from? Like I said last time, most of the opinions come from, more people have learned from, about heaven from movies than from churches or from secular songs than churches. Churches have stopped talking about heaven. <laughs> so, but you notice the West Hollywood is making movies about heaven all the time. But the thing is, they don't know anything about heaven. They don't go to the Bible as their source. They are talking about a different heaven, the heaven of their imagination. And since nobody tells people about it, today we are ashamed to talk about heaven. We are ashamed to stand up there and open, a Bible, open the Bible and say, I'm going to speak about heaven. That's why I purposely opened like that last week. I'm going to speak about heaven. <laughs> Preachers are outright ashamed these days of talking about heaven because they wonder if heaven is there or not. <laughs> That's the problem. They just can't believe that something like that can exist. They can't imagine that. And the one who has spread this lie that heaven may not be there, if it's there, it's a boring place, it's a dry place where everybody's just floating like cotton candy, just picking on their harp 24 hours of the day for the rest of eternity, you know, in a half asleep state, you know. That kind of idea has been spread by the devil about heaven. Now, the Bible says the devil is a liar and a father of lies. He's the inventor of lies. He's always in the business of attacking God, attacking God and his people with his lies. Now, one of the things that he likes to lie about very much 
is heaven. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Everybody. Love and just forever. 